presenter really needs no introduction. He's a, a local kind of icon in this community. Um, his presentation is entitled Psychotherapy, the Sacred Core of the Work. And I'm sure you all know Dr. Michael Geis. Um, he is uh, an adult and child psychiatrist here in private practice. Um, he's a faculty member at the uh, Continuing Education Division at Santa Barbara City College, where he teaches classes on the soul as seen from the perspective of psychology, philosophy, and poetry. So without further ado, please welcome Michael Guy. Thank you. Um, Sometimes I feel my practice is about putting the stress back in people's lives <laughs> rather than taking it out. And you'll see why as we go along. It's uh, psychotherapy of depth often is stressful for the person who's going to take that descent. Um, it's also stressful for the therapist to work deeply with someone. And therefore, I have pictures up in my office of people that I don't know whose eyes support me. I like them looking at me, like I have some behind my patients. So they can't see them, but as I'm working, I see them. And I find them in the strangest places. This was this man. This man was mowed down in the Holocaust. And uh, somebody took pictures in the 30s before it happened, went to the shtetls in Poland, and took a lot of these pictures. And I saw that book. And there was something about this man's face. As soon as I opened that page in the book, I couldn't get him out of my mind. And so. Um, I look at him as I do my work, and in particularly as I volunteered for this Grand Rounds, and I set this title up, it was a very ambitious title about the sacred core of the work and what is the soul and the spirit and the essence and the core of a person. You know, then you set it up a few months in advance, and then you head toward it. I tell you, Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet, has a wonderful poem where he builds a house, but he starts the house with the flag in the sky and builds up to meet the flag. So in a way, my title was the flag, and I had these months to head toward it. And as I headed toward it, I was very nervous and began to, oh God. And then I've got this kid in me who gets really afraid being exposed, standing in front of all of you, what am I going to say? Well, this guy really started to help me. I, I looked at him one day, and when I look, saw him looking at me, I felt in touch with the man who can give this talk. When I saw him looking at me, there was something about the mutual gaze that began to shift my being from the kid who was afraid to give the talk to the man who can give the talk. That's a very, when you experience something like that. So that's going to be partly a metaphor for this talk. That is about, can we be with our patients in certain ways that the way we are with them and the way we look at them can help shift their state of being so that someone in them, maybe who has never been met before, can presence in their life. That is the sacred core of the work. Can you be with someone in such a way, look at them and be with them in such a way as this man was with me, where I suddenly made a shift inside and found the man who can talk to you like this, that shift in a patient's being, Winnicott called the true self. 
And Winnicott is a dear man, an English psychoanalyst who was a pediatrician first, good guy. And so it's as if you have a second self. It's a term in the literature too, not in the psychological literature, in sort of the literature, literature. <laughs> a second self. So Winnicott, when he, uh, when he published this article in 1960, the true and false self. Now the problem with that, we're going to use this, I'm not going to use that term very much, I don't like it, false self, but what he means is who you usually are. When you're not wearing your heart on your sleeve, when you're just being who you are, your usual personality that has an important function of getting you through life, okay? As opposed to what he's calling the true self, which is the core of a person, the aliveness of a person, when, when you are, he said, it's when you're being most creative and most spontaneous, playing also, that part of you. And so, um, especially a part that feels very real and very alive, as opposed to feeling dead, futile. What's the point? So he's, he's after something in six, 1960 with that term that really caught on, this true self. For example, he says, the best example, quoting him, I can give is that of a middle-aged woman who had a very successful false self, personality, who had the feeling all her life that she had not started to exist, and that she had always been looking for a means of getting to her true self. It was as if, he said, she had this caretaker self who found the therapist and brought her to the therapist and sampled the therapy and tested the reliability of the therapist. All these tests brought her there, tested the therapist. And Winnicott's notion was this self that does that, that seeks out a therapist, is looking for the conditions in which this other dimension of their life that feels real and alive, has a chance to surface, is searching for the conditions. That can make that kind of therapy extremely important. The patient gets, thinks there's nothing as important in their life right now as this. It, because, you see, it's sometimes a matter of life and death about finding that essence, that core. So as he says it, the personality, I'm going to use the term personality instead of false self. So the personality has its main concern, a search for conditions which will make it possible for the true self to come into its own. If conditions cannot be found, then there must be reorganized a new defense against exploitation of the true self. And if there be doubt, if there be doubt whether you can protect the core of you, then the clinical result is suicide. Suicide, in this context, is the destruction of the total self in avoidance of the annihilation of the true self. And when suicide is the only defense left against betrayal of the true self, then it becomes the lot of the personality to organize the suicide. This, of course, involves its own destruction, but at the same time eliminates the need for its continued existence, since its function is the protection of the true, true self from insult. Okay? So it can get pretty serious. Some people can feel, unless this thing works, what we're doing together, I don't think I'll go on. And sometimes that's a very serious statement. So, a caretaker self, he called it, brought her to the therapy and is sampling the therapist to see, is, am I in the conditions 
where something else can surface. At the end of the article, he says it this way, using the analogy of a nurse. It's as if a nurse brings a child. And at first, the analyst discusses the child's problem, and the child is not directly contacted. It's as if the nurse brings the child. Okay? Analysis, now, here's interesting. This is pure Winnicott. Analysis does not start. We could say therapy does not start until the nurse has left the child with the analyst. And the child has become able to remain alone and has started to play. Okay? So somehow this other personality has to hand over. One of my patients now who's really struggling with this, and I may men mention it later, has a younger part of her that she can feel inside her, and this younger part says, I want to contact Geis. I want to contact him. And she is petrified of letting that happen. Petrified of letting that happen. And we can, I think I'll touch on that later. But sometimes that sense of when he, it, it sounds simple, leaving the child with the therapist. <laughs> yeah. She's petrified. She says, it'll be quicksand for both of us. All right. So what Winnicott is after is that we find a way to exist and not just be reactive not just comply with other people, but to find a basic core part of your being to live from. And he's got a wonderful sentence here, which I'll read to you. I love this sentence. Listen to this. Sometimes, the person finds a way of enabling the true self to start to live. Such an outcome may be achieved by all manner of means, but here's the phrase, but we observe most closely those instances in which the sense of things being real or worthwhile arrives during a treatment. Isn't that beautiful? But we observe most closely those instances in which the sense of things being real or worthwhile arrives during a treatment. That's what he's after, okay? I'm calling that the sacred core of the work, of what's, what is arriving. What's arriving? Or who's arriving in a moment like that? Listen to this. Here's uh, James Grotstein, an, an, an analyst in LA. Here's one of his situations. A married career woman in her early 50s, the mother of three children, entered therapy with me claiming that she was suffering from midlife crisis. She related the following story during a session in New York City on business. She decided to take a walk after breakfast one morning. While walking down a street that was familiar to her, she suddenly became aware of another woman, much younger and more beautiful than she, walking toward her from the opposite direction. Their eyes met for a moment, then each continued walking. The patient admitted being haunted by and obsessed with this other woman and her gaze. The younger woman, their eyes meet, and now she's haunted. Her talk revealed her belief that the woman was her double. Her double. That's also from not from our literature, but literature, literature, was her double, <laughs> an almost exact double of her 30 years earlier when she first went to New York to become an actress. She then said how she'd been plagued by self-doubts and self-consciousness all her life and her terrible feelings that she'd been a failure in her previous marriage and in her acting career. I, Gratstein says, I said to the patient, that she regarded the woman she had encountered in New York as her lost self. The innocent one whom she felt she could not hold on to because it was not safe to do so. She had always felt bad for having to desert that self and was now feeling extremely sad and lonely 
because of her encounter with what seemed to her to be her double for a former self that somehow seemed to be still waiting somewhere to be found. This is so interesting, isn't it? That self is still waiting somewhere to be found. That's the start of a poem. Okay? And subsequent therapy focused on the retrieval of that lost self. So you can see how that can be imagined that way. Something waiting to be found. And, and a little bit, Walt Whitman tells us that he's waiting to be found. That's exactly his image of, you know, after he's gone, are you going to find him? Because it may have a lot to do with this core of your life, because that's what Whitman was writing about. Okay, so who's waiting for you? To, who's waiting? Who's the double? Who's, who's waiting to be found? That is a wonderful question. And what, since, remember, Winnicott's faith is that if you establish the right conditions as a therapist, this thing will begin to presence toward you. It will want to come into existence, this lost self, this double, this true self, this core, this part of aliveness that has not been safe to live will want to come toward you. So I have found overall that if I stay very relaxed in my chair and pe you know, people are talking and words go through them and through me, but I don't pay a lot of attention. I'm just aware of that stream of words. And mostly I'm listening right through here because every once in a while they'll say a word or give an image which impacts me right here. It might be the word alone. And it's the one word in the sentence that hits. I've learned that that is this other part of the self trying to reach me. It tries to reach me from the invisible into my body. It tries to make a direct contact with my body, or with, you could say with my feelings. I have to be really embodied to feel that moment. That's where I go in the therapy. Oh, tell me more about alone, you say. What's that like? You know, just simple things like that. You're just listening for that impact. I am. Um, it's, it's what Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, said. It's it's a sign of address. You're being addressed. If you allow yourself to feel it, this core of the person is trying to find you, is addressing you. And it addresses you by having an emotional impact on you. At least it does on me. And now I'm not talking about extremely exceptional moments in therapy. Not just about that. For example, One of my patients is working on his PhD. And he's just about completed his thesis. And it is enormous. It's huge. It's like maybe 500 pages. <laughs> and he's about to submit it to, you know, for final things to the advisors and all of that. So he says to me, it, it, it's gonna be, this is going to be terrible. They, they are going to tell me to cut it, to cut it. And I feel so bad because I, if I'm not careful, I can get intimidated by authorities. I'm not easy with those who hold power like that. And so am I going to just cave in? Am I just going to comply? That's Winnicott's favorite term for this false self. The, it comp we comply, compliance. Am I just going to comply, or am I going to rebel? And is there any other choice between complying and rebelling? I'm really worried about this. So I say something that's really a little bit stupid at that point. It's like I give him advice. And 
I say something that goes like this. Well, you know, you haven't written your last two chapters yet, which are the discussion and the conclusion. Once you have those clear in mind, you'll be able to go back through those 500 pages and easily cut out what isn't relevant. What isn't relevant? Well, some, was that the wrong thing to say? The, because he says, she, he says, in effect, what are you talking about? This would be cutting out my soul. I've taken a lot of care with this. And then all of a sudden, after he said that, for the next like 20 minutes, another part of the self surfaced. I mean, and it surfaced toward me. And it was something that go, it went like, you know, the only way I'm going to consider cutting anything is if these advisors sit down with me and give me good arguments that I can understand about why this should be eliminated. The last thing I'm going to do is just they say, bring it back at 250 pages or something. No way. I'm willing to find other advisors. I am not going to do that. Now this emergence, this is what I mean, we're not talking about exceptional moments in therapy. I'm just talking about a shift when all of a sudden you feel that someone else is in the room. Remember he said, I, I, I'm either going to comply or rebel. But this voice, they are going to meet me eye to eye and we're going to sit down and look at it. And I will need to be convinced about the weight of their argument about anything this important, because this has become part of his core, what he's writing about. Okay, so that's what I mean about a moment. Now, it's important that the therapist recognize that that's happening. I don't mean just, oh, that's interesting, I understand, that sounds good. I mean that someone is presencing at that moment that's very important. You, you take it in. You take it in. And as Winnicott showed us, you mirror it back. I hear another place in you. This is very convincing. I really hear a whole other respectful voice in you. Engage, you know, something that mirrors back that shows not only do you hurt it, you got it. You got it. Because that is what allows the person to really get it. That someone in the world heard its significance and says, I heard that, and this is really worthwhile. Boom! That's a moment of total reality. When the core of the self is joined with the world, in this case, the therapist, that joining makes a new reality inside the person. Um, good, we still have a lot of time, that's great. <laughs> All right, so um, here's another kind of example. Um, a man comes to me, we've probably just worked six or seven times now. And he has been through a disastrous divorce, is a single parent, half time with his two kids, nine and six, girl nine, boy six. Had a terrible divorce. Felt very humiliated by his wife. And at his job, he had arranged to bring a man into the job who got put at a higher level, and arranged for his dismissal. Was able to manipulate things that got him to go. Another huge betrayal. But every time, and he came into therapy saying, you know, I don't feel much of a success anymore, and I don't want to measure myself by the customary culture standards of what a success is. We had to sell our house too. So I'm not sure who I am. 
So when we tried to talk about the divorce a bit and the betrayal at work, each time we tried to talk about that, he went immediately back to his teenage years when his parents divorced. Because when I asked him, what did that feel when your ex-wife did that? Or what was that betrayal like at work? So it was like being kicked in the stomach and uh, I think exactly the way it was, age 10, 11, when my older siblings were gone, they had, they had gone on to, to college, I was left with my twin brother at home, the parents' conflicts escalated horribly, it's a Catholic family, my brother and I got down on our knees at night and prayed as the parents were yelling. And that's what I think about. Every time we tried to talk about the recent events, he went there. So I thought, well, we, we've got to look at that boy. So, and so here's kind of like a typical, another ordinary moment in therapy. So he's sitting with his eyes closed, and I just said, can you see that boy? that teenager, he said, he's tired. He's tired and he's done. This, this divorce stuff has dragged on too damn long. I said, so much has dragged on, thinking about the marriage, the, 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 jo the job thing. He's tired and hurt. I said, can you see his eyes? I'm trying to get him really to pay attention to the presence of this younger part. Nothing very complicated. He said, I can't see his eyes, only his body. He's standing, leaning against a wall. And I know what wall he's leaning on. Now, when he said that, I tell you, I had one of those moments. He's standing, leaning against a wall. He's tired and done. All of a sudden, I felt it too. Meaning, I thought, oh, this is important. Remember I said it can be a word, it can be an image. I thought, this is it. This is it. So depending on your orientation, there, you, someone might have them, him draw that scene, someone might have him move. So, so we're talking. I'm just trying to keep him in contact with anything that just landed here in me that said, I'm here. This is it. Stay with me. Okay. So it all kept going on. It, it went on thinking of the divorce, even through college. And I said, yes, into the marriage. The kid had to absorb and be careful what he let out, not make a situation worse, try to hold the situation together. See what happened. After the father left, the mother started to drink. And he then felt that he had to come right home after high school, monitor how the mother was doing, open the mail to see what the latest legal um, stuff is going on. And so, and when he heard the mother dr uh, breaking bottles once in the garage, I mean, it just, he just got panicked. So he, he was set up to monitor the whole thing, okay? So, and so I said, you had to be careful what you let out, not make a situation worse. Try to hold the situation together. Now, as you know, this is not anything having to do with what Winnicott means by the true self, the spontaneous urges of, a, no, you're, you're out there having to be highly alert outside of you to hold a situation together, to hold a mother together, to hold your brother together, whatever. I then asked something really good. I said, can you, when he said he couldn't see the eyes, I said, can you imagine his eyes? I don't know where that came from, but that was a winner. <laughs> Can you imagine his eyes? He said, oh, yeah. He said, he's, he's been crying, and there wasn't a lot of room for all that then. So in a minute or so, he said, if I were to look at a kid like that, now, if I were to look at a kid like that, I'd go up and hold him like I do with my own kids when they're sad. I said, follow that. Follow that, that inclination to hold him, the one who had to hold it together for a long time, his tiredness. He says, I'd take him off the wall 
and have him lean on me, lay him down so he can rest and I'd be with him. He does all that. I t he takes him off the wall, has him lean on him, lays him down. Okay, bread and butter therapy here. But here's what's about to happen in an interesting way. I, I say, now make some eye contact with him. He says, I'm laying down and holding him like I hold my daughter. I look into her eyes. She has my eyes, he says. But his eyes have a sadness, but a relief now. All of a sudden, in the act of looking at the boy, what presences through him is the father in him, the fathering one in him that says, I know what to do in this situation. I do it with my own child. I can give that to him. That's again what I'm talking about is an ordinary example where all of a sudden a shift occurs in the person where another well of strength and authenticity came, comes up when he says, I would know exactly what to do. I know how to do it already. I am such a father. My daughter has my eyes. What eyes? The eyes of a kind, loving father. That is who presenced in that moment. And again, the job of the therapist is just to be aware of the significance of that presencing. I just say, he knows you're looking into his eyes, just as you know you're looking. He knows you're looking into his eyes, and he is looking into your eyes. Yes. And I have them hold that mutual gaze for a while. OK. What I'm telling you is, a therapist in this dimension that I'm talking about is one who can sense the invisible presence of someone about trying to surface, like the person with the thesis and that authentic voice, this man with that fathering side of him, senses that invisible presence has often been named spirit, the person's spirit. And I am not speaking theologically today. I'm just trying to speak from my ground as a therapist. But the word has often been used because when I say that a, a dimension of the self is seeking conditions in which it can surface into the therapy and toward the therapist, you could use other language and say, and say the spirit is trying to embody or incarnate or come into this reality. It, we just use other technical language saying, oh, another self state has a chance to be present. But it's very dry. To think that a part of the person's spirit is seeking a way of being present. I love to use that verb, presencing. It's presencing. The job of the therapist is, is to say, oh, it's one of those moments. I see it. I hear it. I'll mirror it back. I acknowledge it. So I want to show you a couple of scenes from my favorite movie. It's the German film, Wings of Desire. And to kind of illustrate this theme. OK, here's the situation. And uh, I'll need a few minutes to introduce this. <laughs> there you are, ready with the lights and everything. OK, so you guys, you guys are with me. We're, 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 you're with me on this. OK, this magnificent film by Wenders is this situation. It's present day Berlin. And two angels, two men in overcoats, who have been there from the beginning of time, are still watching over the city. 
in the, in the first scene I'm going to show you, they, they, they meet these two angels, and they're sitting in a new car salesman's uh, showcase in a car. No one can see them except children. <laughs> they're sitting in the car, and I love it. They, they, could, they each take out their notebook, and they ask the other, well, what did you see today? And uh, you're going to hear one talk about, you know, one man in a prison just banged his head against the wall. And I love it. And, he's at the other, and he says, uh, one guy, and you'll have to read all this. This is the subtitles. And he says, um, the, the station, the guy on the train, the conductor, as it was coming into the U-band for the zoo, yells out something like, Tierra del Furgo. What's that place? Fuego. He yells, Tierra del Fuego. The so he reports that. The conductor, instead of yelling out the zoo, yells out that. And, and his friend, I love it, says the German word schön, which is beautiful. Beautiful. So that's the, kinds, that's the kind of things they observe. Now, the second, so then he turns to his friend and says, well, what, what did you see today? And the guy gives him a couple examples. But all of a sudden, the second angel who's the main character, says things like, you know, I'm tired of this life, always knowing, always, you know, saying amen, always. I, I want to know what it is to live in a body and be here with those people. I want to know. I'm frustrated. By the way, who, he, he mentions... I. He thinks, oh, God, you know, like when Philip Marlowe came home and fed his cat. Now, is that an old detective, Philip Marlowe? Yes. From, okay, so that was a little bit before my time. So he, he's trying to say, <laughs> I want to have just ordinary embodied experience. So the reason I'm showing you that when I say the invisible presence in your patient that sometimes is called spirit has a desire to come here has it to that 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 some part of the of the person is trying to set up the conditions so his spirit can have a life here and be real instead of feeling futile so we see in this film Wenders imagining that the spirit itself the one you walled away so Winnicott's idea is that this core of you which if annihilated you would suicide this core of you has usually been squirreled away somewhere and is heavily protected. Okay? And the idea that this core in you has a life and is, would like to have the conditions to come out is represented in this film by the uh, angel saying, I, I want to try it. I want to try it. I want to come here. So let's watch that first part because... He is eventually going to try it, and before he does, he's going to meet a man that's going to really determine this. So let's see that, um, that part one. Der Schrafen stand plötzlich, sie hat ein Häftling befunden, dem Kopf gegen die Wand gerannt ist. Jetzt gesagt. An der U-Bahn-Station 2 rief der Beamte des Stationsnamens plötzlich das Feuerland aus. Schön. In den Mühlbergen saß ein alter Mann, ein Kind aus der Odyssee vor und der kleine Zuhörer, der dabei ganz zu blinzeln aufhörte. Und du, was hast du zu erzählen? Eine Wasserhand, in die mit dem Regen den Schirm zusammenklappte, sich nass werden ließ. Ein Schüler, der seinen Lehrer beschrieb, wie ein Pfarrer aus der Erde wächst. Und der Stamm der Lehrer. Eine Blinde, die nach ihrer Uhr tastete, als sie mich spürte. Es ist herrlich, nur geistig zu leben, Tag für Tag für die Ewigkeit von den Leuten rein, was geistig ist, zu bezeugen. Aber manchmal wird mir meine ewige Geistesexistenz zu viel. Ich möchte dann nicht mehr so ewig drüber schweben. Ich möchte ein Gewicht an mir spüren dass die Grenzenlosigkeit an mir aufhebt und mich erdfest macht. Ich möchte bei jedem Schritt oder Windstoß jetzt und jetzt und jetzt sagen können. Und nicht wie immer seit je und in Ewigkeit. Sich anwählen, vereinbar zum Kartentisch setzen, begrüßt werden, 
auch bloß mit einem Nick. Die ganze Zeit, wenn wir schon einmal mittaten, war es doch nur zum Schein. Haben uns im nächtlichen Ringkampf mit einem von denen zum Schein die Hüfte ausrenken lassen, haben zum Schein einen Fisch mitgefangen, haben zum Schein an den Tafeln gesessen, haben getrunken und gegessen zum Schein, haben uns Lämmer braten und Wein aufwarten lassen, draußen bei den Zelten in der Wüste, nur zum Schein. Nicht, dass ich ja gleich ein Kind zeugen oder einen Baum pflanzen möchte. Aber es wäre doch schon etwas, beim Nachhausekommen nach einem langen Tag, die Philipp Marlow in die Katze zu finden. Klima haben. Schwarze Finger von Zeitung lesen. Sich nicht immer nur am Geist begeistern, sondern endlich an einer Mahlzeit. Einer Nackenlinie. Ein Ohr. Wie gedruckt. Gehen das Knochengerüst und sich mitgehen spüren. Endlich ahnen, statt immer alles zu wissen. Ach, O, oh, A ah, und B sagen können. Statt Ja und A. Jetzt scheinbar auch begeistern können am Bösen. Das hat mit Vorbeigehen, alle die Monde Erde auf sich übertragen. Endlich hinaus in die Welt, ja. Ein Wilder. Oder endlich zu spüren, wie es ist, unter dem Tisch die Schuhe auszuziehen und die Zehen auszustrecken, barfuß. So. Allein bleiben, geschehen lassen, ernst bleiben. Mhm. Wild können wir nur in dem Maß sein, wie wir unbedingt ernst bleiben. Nichts weiter tun als anschauen, sammeln, zollen, glauben, wahren. Geist bleiben, im Abstand bleiben, im Wort bleiben. So, this spirit is tired, he says, of being in the mind. And in the True Self article, Winnicott says, sometimes, sometimes we can hide in the mind rather than embody in life. He's tired of being in the mind. He wants to come into existence. And you hear this other part of the self say, you know, remain serious. Don't take that step. One of my favorite passages in a, a book by Harry Guntrip was who, a woman's in pay, uh, therapy with him. And every time they're having a, they have good sessions, every time she crosses the threshold to enter the office, she sees another person, another woman, at the threshold saying, don't go in there. I'm not going to let you in there. Every time she steps into her therapist's office. So, to take that step, he's, he's beginning now to think about that step. That's the step I'm talking about, of helping the spirit embody in these simple ways to have a life, to have a life here with us that potential. Now, the actor Peter Falk, who, was, who played Columbo on television a long time, plays himself in this movie as an actor who has been flown over to Germany to be in a film. Falk in this film uh, is, uh, is uh, an actor. He goes in and out of parts for a, play, for a movie. And when he's not acting, he loves to draw. And that angel who wants to come here has noticed him, has some, noticed something about him, and is really curious about Falk. So in the second scene you're going to see, it's early morning, it's in a very desolate part of, of Berlin, and there's this little snack bar where they have schnitzels and coffee, it's cold, and Falk is standing there with his drawing pad, just having an early morning cup of coffee and a smoke. And the angel approaches him. Now, naturally, only children can see him, right? So the angel is so curious for some reason about Falk, and you're going to see what happens. Now, when I say that the therapist must see the invisible, 
must sense the presence of what's trying to happen, this, you'll see, is what Falk can do. What happens? What does Falk do when he senses the invisible presence of the spirit who is curious about making a transition into this reality? Watch how Falk handles that. It's, it's, it's a beautiful metaphor. Okay. <clears throat> I can't see you, but I know you're here. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. You've been hanging around since I got here. I wish I could see your face. Just look into your eyes and tell you how good it is to be here. Just to touch something. See, that's cool. I feel good. Here, yeah. the smoke. Have coffee. And if you do it together, it's fantastic. Or, the draw. You know, you take a pencil and you make a dark line. Then you make a light line. And together it's a good line. But when your hands are cold, you rub them together. See, that's good. That feels good. There's so many good things. But you're not here. I'm here. I wish you were here. I wish you could talk to me. Because I'm a friend. I am a friend. Anybody know what the word compañero means? Compa is that Spanish? Very Spanish. Okay. Very Spanish. Um, It's, it's so reminiscent of Whitman's famous line, camarado, I'm a companion, camarado. Okay, all I'm saying is what Falk is doing, that welcoming, hospitable presence to invite the spirit here, is, that's what touches me about that moment. And... Um, He feels it, he senses it, he believes in that reality, that that, that spirit is there. And the spirit, as, as, as Whitman is imagining his own death at the end of Song of Myself, is, as he's imagining he's not going to be here very much longer for us, he talks to us. Listener up there, hear you, what have you to confide to me? Look in my face. Talk honestly, for no one else hears you, and I stay only a minute longer. He stays only a minute longer. Will you speak before I am gone? Will you prove already too late? I depart as air, I shake my white locks at the runaway sun, I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. Okay, so it's as if the spirit, the angel, now speaking through Whitman, says, is anybody, is anybody going to invite me? Are you going to look for me? I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. This is like the true self speaking directly through him. Are you going to find me? Do you have any idea that I'm here? And the ending of the whole tremendous song of myself is this. 
failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. That's how he ends the whole thing. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Um, I think I want to just present a little bit longer than open it for questions. Let me, um, I'm not, what, what is about to happen here is that he's over the edge now with, with Falk's hand and the fact that he has spotted a woman, a circus performer, that he's very attractive. Remember he said uh, an ear, a line of the neck. He wants to know, he wants to know a sexual connection as well. He wants to know love as well with a woman. So he is now right, you know, he, he's not going to just stay there. And he goes behind the Berlin Wall in that no man's land and meets his friend, the other angel, and says, I am ready. Let me strongly recommend this movie, Wings of Desire. He says, I am ready. And then talks about what he imagines his first day will be. All of a sudden, this movie now has been black and white. Starts <coughs> in color. The blood comes into him, and his friend notices he's now leaving footprints. Huh. <laughs> and he's really worried because there are two soldiers in East Germany walking right by. And all of a sudden, he he collapses into the arms of his friend. His friend is just holding him. He's ready to make the transition here. And that transition here of a, of a core part of the self, here into this reality, is what we're talking about today. So I think I won't show that. I tell you what, some of you have to go from 115 or so. I will be glad to stay and show that, you know, if for anybody of you who can stay and you want to see that, we could do could we do that? Between two, right? So we could do that. All right. The dilemma for the therapist is often that what we are trying to offer our presence for and let something come across. What if, what if what is trying to come across, <coughs> what if it's been put away in one of those Austrian cellars, like some of those kids were? And now, we're going to try to let it come across when it's already turned weird and rageful. It's isolated in its cellar for so long, in agony protected away in agony. And it too makes an attempt in the right conditions of therapy what, it, what is in horrible pain in you to surface. And that is the whole art of psychotherapy when therapy gets really difficult that way. In my dream I was in a cave and all of a sudden I see a little creature wrapped in linen bindings screaming in such pain that I could not bear it. And I said magnanimously, I'm going to kill it to put it out of its misery. But I was the one in misery. I was the one in misery. And I picked up a shovel that was lying on the floor of the cave, and just before I was it, trying to bash its skull in, it, it, it made a convulsive movement with its face and the, the muzzle of a dog appeared through the binding, and for some reason I was so touched by that, that I threw the shovel down. But the point I'm just trying to make is that what is, what is trying to come into this reality is sometimes in such pain, in such torment, that it is the true art and spirit of the therapist to know how to welcome that, because the caretaker self that brought the patient to you is going to be in terror of that part coming through. My patient says, it's quicksand. 
it's quicksand for both of us. And so how that, you know, I, um, I put on this some, an orange flyer. If anybody, I'd be happy to start a consultation group and working this way uh, for licensed therapists. If anybody wants to call me uh, about, the, you know, our setting up a group, uh, just call me and take one of those. But that is the great art of therapy when what is trying to presence and wants incarnation that the usual self is absolutely in terror of this happening and highly resistant to it. So let me, before opening it up to questions and then we can watch that if you want, um, I said it is a, quite a moment when one of my colleagues in New York said, those moments where your patient sees you recognizing and affirming what was never met before. I love that. Sees you recognizing and affirming what was, we could say who, was never met before. That is such a privilege. That is the sacred core of the work, and that is why many of us are doing this. This is a great thing to welcome into this reality what you saw Peter Falk do, say, I'm your friend, come here. There are things here that you should know about. You don't have to stay in your mind and live an isolated life. So let me conclude with a beautiful poem by the American poet William Stafford, who a couple of days before he died wrote this. Um, it is again about a moment. What I'm talking about is in, your, in the ordinary therapies that you guys do, occasionally there will be a moment like I'm talking about, where something else tries to surface, and it's up to you to know, aha, aha, it's happening. All right. So this poem, the short <laughs> poem, is called At Fourth in Maine, in the town of Liberal, Kansas, 1932. <coughs> At 4th and Main in Liberal, Kansas, 1932. An inner instant, no, sorry. An instant sprang at me. A winter instant. A thin gray panel of evening. Slanted shadows leaned from a line of trees where rain had slicked the sidewalk. Slanted shadows leaned from a line of trees where rain had slicked the sidewalk. No one was there. It was only a quick flash of a scene, unplanned, without connection to anything that meant more than itself, without connection to anything that this didn't mean more than itself. But I, but I carried it onward like the gift from a child who knows that the giving is what is important. The paper, the ribbon, the holding of breath and surprise, the friends around, and God holding it out to you, even a rock or a slice of evening. And behind it, the whole world. To be able to be a therapist and know when a slice of a moment has just been handed to you, is trying to find you, and you can hold a hand back and say, that, this moment, yes, Stafford saw that moment, Falk saw it, that moment, felt that moment, that is the work, because when a God talks, when you greet that moment, and the person's core, aliveness, knows it's been seen, met, and a hand reached out to. It, has a, it will take the risk of stepping over that threshold into embodiment here. Okay, that's the talk. <laughs> No, anybody want to, I know some of
of you have to leave, feel free to get up and go. Anybody want to uh, say anything? Anything that touched you? An ordinary person's question. <laughs> I, I understood what you said about being there the wrong person in the room, allowing this computer. What I'd like to know is what what you as the therapist feel in your, about yourself in that moment. In other words, do you have to feel like you're being in your truest self, or are you being the therapist? You know, um, in order for this to work, it almost sounds like you, you know, like you have to like sit down and meet some William Stafford before you know you walk into that session and just be in that place in order for it to come to you. Or does it not? I'm just wondering how it feels for you. So, how does it feel for the therapist? And do you have to do any special preparation to to get there? Um, what I said earlier. First of all, if, this, if it is your vocation to be a therapist, if it is your calling to be a therapist in this way, then there is no difference. You are, you, that's your calling. I am being who I am. But what I added is, is that I just relax because I trust that this thing wants to happen. I don't have to make it happen. It wants to happen. So I sit there mostly in my chest and belly and wait for it to knock at my gate. So I don't have to read Stafford. I'm just sitting there, <laughs> relaxed. If I, you know, unless I'm too upset in my own life or <laughs> God knows what all that, or the patient is somebody I can't possibly deal with because of my own history, all that stuff. But if that's not going on, I'm just, I'm just kind of waiting for it. The knot, the knot here. Is that is that is that partly what you were asking? Yes, I, pretty much. I you know I mean I I guess what I was saying is I was imagining that you could not always be in that space and so what did that space feel like and how did you get there? Mm -hmm. So I think. So I'm I'm trying to stay relaxed and if I am jerked out of that place by something in my life or the patient's life, then because I know what this place is like, then I can, I, I can, we can bring up and talk about what's happening now. All of a sudden, let's say, I'm very sleepy. How, can you help me with this? All of a sudden, I find myself going to sleep. Or when you, I, I have this wonderful therapist in New York in 1992 wrote a book, The Intimate Edge, Darlene Ehrenberg. And she confesses things. It's like the patient says, you know, I've got to cancel next week session because I'm going away. She thinks, I am so glad. <laughs> and she says to herself, why am I thinking that? <laughs> Honestly, she says to herself, I don't understand why I'm thinking. And she has the guts to say, I don't understand why this just came up in me. And it is a marvelous what happens because all of a sudden the guy breaks down in tears and says something like, this happens to my life all the time. People are glad when I don't show up. <laughs> I mean, so it's like that when you get shifted out of that place, sometimes to be able to say, we, let's talk about what's going on here. You know, that person may have gone into a dead part of themselves and all of a sudden you are falling asleep. So this is all part of, you know, you don't have to always be alert and ready for the winter instant, to, but to know when it's shifted. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you for that. Uh, in a hypothetical situation, if you were treating a patient and you were opening your heart, but there were four other therapists in the room opening their heart, how would you differentiate whether when that person came to that spiritual moment, whether it was really your moment or all the therapists got it together? <laughs> so, so I mean, all the other therapists. You were you're in a room with your patient, right? And you open your heart, and when something hits your heart, how do you differentiate whether that's really something with your spirit, my spirit, rather than their spirit that's coming out? So, if you had four other therapists in the room that had different spirit than you, would they all recognize it as? that person's spirit coming out, or would some people not do anything because it didn't hit their spirit? You know, it's, it, 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 
I think I recognize the heart of the question, but I've learned that it's not that important in a moment like that for me to distinguish between their spirit and my spirit, because when that thing surfaces, it's like an arrow coming up between us in our relational field, and that arrow bifurcates to present through them and present through me. It goes like that. And so part of it evokes something in me, at my pole, and part of it is happening to them over here. The total reality is what's happening to both of us. And so I can say something about, this is what it's like for me, how is this for you? And in that dialogue, we'll sort out, is this, is this mine, is this yours, is this both of ours? Are we both inside the same event? Or did I just get triggered of something that's mostly me? I can sort that out with them. But I'm no longer worried about at the beginning of mine and theirs because the relational field often it bifurcates like that and it's a total experience of the two of us. But, you know, it's a very technical question of, in, in therapy. Okay, um, so I will take one more and then I guess a lot of you are still sitting here because you want to see that, is that right? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Hi, Michael. Hi. I just wanted to check out if I'm on your page. Okay. <laughs> Good. It seems to me like the heading of all this could be the conflict of polarity. This polarity, which could be embodying soul and the other personality. So, embodying soul, say, is an ambassador of singularity versus the resistance of the conditioned personality. Yes, I think we're on the same page. The resistance of the usual personality to that embodiment. And that is, of course, played out by the two angels. The second angel, his friend, is saying, you know, don't go there, stay serious. So, would it be okay? We'll, we'll just play the just the add, and then when I, you have to go... Can I just add to that? For me, the good news is the soul always wins if we don't watch the clock. <laughs> They're about to enter this God-forsaken no man's land of the other side. And that's where the other angel wants to get out of. He wants to get out of the no man's land. That's where you know, he wants to leave. What? Ich werde in den Fluss steigen. Alter menschlicher Spruch, oft gehört, den ich heute erst verstehe. Jetzt rennen die Augenblicke ja fort, aber es wird kein anderes Ufer geben. Die Furt gibt es nur, solange wir drinnen im Fluss sind. Hinein in die Furt der Zeit, die Furt des Todes. Herab von unserem Ausguck der Ungeborenen. Zuschauen ist nicht herabschauen, es geschieht auf Augenhöhe. Zuerst werde ich ein Bad gehen. Dann lasse ich mich rasieren. Wird es von einem türkischen Barbier. Der wird mich auch massieren bis zu den Fingerspitzen. Dann kaufe ich mir eine Zeitung und lese sie von den Schlagzeilen bis zum Morgen. <lacht> Am ersten Tag werde ich mich nur bedienen lassen. Wer was von mir will, den weiß ich weiter zu leben. Wer über meine ausgestreckten Beine stolpert, wird sich möglichst bei mir entschuldigen. Ich werde mich anrempeln lassen und zurückrempeln. Der wird die tollen Lokal wird mir sofort einen freien Tisch finden. Auf der Straße wird ein Dienstwagen vor mir halten und der Bürgermeister wird mich ein Stück wegnehmen. Jedem werde ich bekannt vorkommen und niemanden verdächtig. Kein Wort werde ich sprechen und jede Sprache verstehen. Das wird mein erster Tag sein. Aber nichts davon wird wahr sein. <lacht> So 
of tension in his arms, and just before he's going to drop down. 